lots of things psychologists do in a little bit more detail. Um, where might psychologists work? So why would you want to study psychology? What sort of jobs can you do? Uh, and also, what are the different areas that psychologists work in? And finally, um, I'd like to finish off just talking a little bit about what it's like coming to university, what some of the expectations, uh, you know, which would be good to have, what, what, what's involved in coming to lectures, what's involved in doing the assignments, because uh, it's a little bit different, obviously, from going to high school. We can, we'll get to that at the end. And then, hopefully, you've got lots of questions about psychology, and hopefully I've got the answers. Uh, so if you do have any questions, uh, don't be afraid to ask them. I'm more than happy to uh, answer any question you've got about psychology. Okay. So we talked a little bit earlier this morning about uh, some of the phenomena that psychologists look at. Um, and this idea that psychologists use scientific methods to study the human mind and human behaviour as well. Right? And that we develop theories to test them, uh, and that this testing of our theories gives us new knowledge that we can actually uh, add to this established body of knowledge. Right? So this is um, a little bit... This type of practice of psychology is a bit at odds with the popular conception of psychology sometimes. It's all being about what Sigmund Freud did uh, to do a psychoanalysis of dreams. Um, and it's also a little bit different from psychiatry as well, which is often commonly uh, mistaken for what psychologists do. Does anyone know the difference between psychiatrists and psychologists? Yep. Can psychiatrists prescribe medication? Yeah, exactly. It's, that's the um, you know, most obvious difference is psychiatrists can prescribe medication. And that's because psychiatrists are doctors. They've gone through medical training. who do additional study in psychiatry. All right? As a psychologist, you don't do medical training. Right? So you don't learn about um, you know, the sort of physical medical models of the, of the illnesses and of the body. Um, you learn about you know, the thinking and behaviour, the, the psychological life of people. Now, one's not necessarily better than the other. They're just different. Um, and for some types of psychological disorders and problems, uh, you need to combine both psychiatric and psychological care. Right? So psychologists will often work with psychiatrists, um, but they won't be prescribing drugs or, or acting in that fashion, right? Because we're not actually trained to do that, and that's not the point of what psychology is about. Okay. Now, well, let's look then uh, at some of the areas that psychologists might work. Now, this is a, a reasonably long list. Uh, let me just sort of go through some of those. So, uh, psychologists can work in academic and applied research. Right? So, that's what I do. I'm an academic. I work in a university, and I work with... Um, various corporations and government agencies with the problems they're facing as well. So I spend time talking to students, but also people outside of university and doing research projects. Psychologists can also um, counsel or interview clients, so they can do that in a, in a private practice setting. We'll talk more about the places where people might get jobs in a minute. Um, they might uh, design and implement programs to help modify people's behaviour. So one of the goals of psychology is to actually take the knowledge that we develop through testing our theories and actually applying it to real problems. Right, so you might come up with uh, interventions that help people um, manage stress in the workplace or uh, more broader com community level uh, interventions to try and promote healthier behaviour. Right, so healthier eating or you know, using sunscreen and all those types of behaviours can all be informed what by what psychology knows about human behaviour. Um, the other thing that psychologists do is they look at the sorts of treatments, the psycholo psychological treatments we use to try and intervene when people have psychological issues or problems, and we look at whether they're actually effective or not. Right? Because remember, psychology uh, is an evidence-based discipline, and what that means is we don't just do stuff because we think it works. Right? See, we don't go and mess with people's minds just because it could be interesting or, um, or it, could be, um, you know, it might work. We're actually meant to do things that we've got good evidence for them to be likely to work or good evidence that they actually do work. Right? So we might come up with an intervention because it's based on um, the theory that we've got evidence for. We do, we do the intervention or implement the uh, in intervention, but then we should look to see whether that intervention's been effective. Right? So it's always about checking that what we're doing is actually having the desired effect. Uh, obviously, one of the most... Um, uh, Things that, common things that people think about when they think about psychologists is the assessment and treatment of psychological problems. Right? Uh, that's, you know, that is something you would be doing if you were going to become a clinical psychologist. Uh, but you can see it's not the only thing that psychologists do. Another common thing psychologists do is they actually design and administer tests that are 
uh, actually meant to assess uh, different aspects of people. So, for example, your academic aptitude, your level of intelligence, uh, aspects of your personality. And if you've ever applied for a job, uh, you know, a part-time job or, or, or you know, something like that, and you go through a selection agency, um, they'll be asking you all these questions about whether you like to go out to parties, uh, if you had a choice between staying home and watching TV or going out with friends, what would you do? All these are actually questions where they're trying to assess whether you're introverted or extroverted, uh, which is sort of a, it's a major dimension of personality, right? with the idea being for a lot of jobs, uh, extroversion is actually more predictive. It tells us that somebody will do better in the job than if you're introverted. Right? So for some jobs, people look for certain aspects of personality because they think that's going to actually predict uh, how well you'll do in the job. So a lot of selection is designed around trying to actually figure out what type of person you are when you apply for the job. Right? Um, some of it's more successful than others, uh, but it is probably our best chance of trying to um, choose between a large number of people when you're recruiting uh, for certain positions. Now, the other thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about what psychologists do is that lots of people who are actually registered psychologists don't have the job title of psychologist. All right? So uh, you can be a registered psychologist, but you might be working um, as a counsellor, a career consultant, a uh, human resources manager, um, you, know, you might be working in an advertising agency, um, a whole range of different areas. It doesn't mean you're sitting in a clinical setting all the time. Right? It's a, that's a component of psychology, but it's not all of psychology. So let's look uh, at the main areas of specialisation that psychologists uh, might focus on or that you might choose to focus on if you come and study psychology. Right? So you have counselling psychologists. Uh, these are people who help individuals and groups with personal well-being. Uh, with their relationships at work, uh, recreation, their personal relationships, uh, their health, and also crisis management. So counselling psychologists are typically dealing with people who have got fairly day-to-day uh, -day issues. Um, they just generally need a little bit extra help to get by day-to-day. -day. Clinical psychologists, on the other hand, tend to diagnose and treat and hopefully prevent a range of mental uh, and physical health issues. So they're dealing with people with... Um, so qualitatively uh, more challenging issues. All right? So that's when you start to get into the problems like anxiety and mood disorders, schizophrenia. These are the things where people actually need quite a bit of assistance to actually uh, help them manage the, the symptoms they're experiencing. Clinical neuropsychologists, um, often they work in hospitals. These are people who actually assess and manage individuals who have, might, might have some type of uh, brain impairment from, from um, an injury, if you have a car accident, uh, or some other type of uh, chemical injury to the brain. You know, if you've been exposed to some toxic uh, chemicals, it might actually, uh, for example, like lead, uh, might actually cause some type of uh, neuropsychological problems. Community psychologists, uh, these are people who actually um, try and work with groups of people to help them achieve their goals, such as uh, in community projects, uh, or even people who are just generally working on this idea of you know, the sense of community and building that up, because the sense of community can, community can have very positive effects for people in terms of their psychological health. Educational and developmental psychologists, this is actually an interesting area. Um, these uh, psychologists work with children as well as adults, um, and they work in terms of um, conducting uh, tests or assessments um, and interventions and counselling services for learning and development, developmental issues across the lifespan. Uh, so uh, sometimes these psychologists will work in schools or, or um, in consultation with schools with students who uh, have uh, you know, some... Other, other styles of learning or learning challenges, uh, but they do work with adults as well. Now, forensic psychologists, a few of you might be interested in becoming a forensic psychologist because you think you get to wear a black coat and carry around a hot cup of coffee and chase after serial killers and things like that, maybe, right? like on all the shows, or you walk into rooms and, and uh, you know, into a murder scene and think, you know, here's a person who hates their mother and uh, I can tell they're six foot two and they've gone that way, you know. All these sort of forensic psychologists on TV. Unfortunately, forensic psychology is not as sexy as what you see on TV, uh, but it's still very important. Right? So forensic psychologists work in a, in a wide range of areas. Right? They work with police. Uh, some people do work with police to help profile uh, serial killers, but it's not the sort of profiling you might be familiar with. It, it's more to do with looking at the features, the locations of crimes, and seeing whether there's some relationship between them. Um, often profilers get it wrong. That's the other thing. Uh, it's not a very precise science. They also work with the courts. Right? Uh, they'll you know, write reports for 
uh, the courts to assess whether somebody's fit to stand trial, uh, you know, whether certain defences might apply to them to do with uh, you know, their mental state at the time of the offence, and they can work in correctional settings as well. So and this is actually probably the, one of the most common things psychologists do is actually um, in, a, in the forensic setting is actually work in prisons. Right, to intervene uh, when prisoners are actually in crisis situations. So depression is unfortunately very common in prisons for obvious reasons, and psychologists help, have to help those inmates. Right? But a large proportion of forensic psychological work is actually writing reports about the assessment of people who are standing trial. Health psychologists. Okay, health psychologists are people who are actually um, trying to promote the prevention and treatment of illnesses um, and they might work in the healthcare system. So they might promote healthier behaviours in the community um, you know, and they can work in a range of areas doing that. One of the uh, master's level courses we have in, in the school is organisational psychology. And what organisational psycho psychologists do is they specialise in the study of psychology in the workplace. Right, so they're particularly interested in things like uh, leadership, teamwork, uh, human resource management, uh, job selection and recruitment and performance assessment, those sorts of things, training and development. Um, but they could also work in areas like market research and advertising as well. Now, sports psychology is also an area that UQ offers as well. Um, and this is where uh, psychologists will work with sports people. They might be amateur sports people or professional sports people. Uh, you might work... Uh, systematically with a club, with a whole team of sports people, uh, to try and maximise um, athletes' performance. Right? You're trying to actually help them overcome a lot of the psychological barriers to competing in sport, um, you know, particularly high-pressure sport, uh, but also just maintaining regular exercise and activity. It can be uh, as routine as that. If somebody's trying to get fit and healthy, a sports psychologist might actually work with them to overcome you know, the barriers you experience where you just don't feel like going for a run you know, five times a week. And finally, academic psychologists, which I mentioned before, and I'm an academic psychologist, um, we're people who conduct research uh, and teach in universities. Um, and I can talk to you in a little bit more detail about the sorts of areas that we specialise in in universities. All right, so it's actually um, it's, it's the last one on my list, but it's actually quite an interesting uh, area to work in. All right, so you can see there there's a long list. That's not an exhaustive list. Oh, and it gets even more complicated than that. And if I showed this list to my colleagues, I'm sure we'd get into some lively debates about all the other things I should add. Uh, but this gives you some idea of the diversity. Uh, and a lot of these topics uh, are topics that we just talked about before in terms of the applied areas where psychologists work. So academic psychologists are interested, obviously, in a lot of those um, applied areas, but we spend most of our time thinking about the basic psych uh, psychological processes that underlie those applied areas. So we generate the knowledge to help um, the applied areas um, use that knowledge in real settings. And some academic psychologists actually spend a lot of their time uh, trying to make sure that what we learn from research gets translated into practice. Right? So it's not as simple as saying academic psychologists are off at the universities and they never come into the real world. Um, we actually do spend a lot of time trying to make sure um, we have an effect on the application of psychological knowledge. Okay, so as you can see here, there's a wide range of topics like developmental psychology, working with children, uh, but also um, uh, people as they age through the whole lifespan, so working with young adults, um, adults uh, and older adults as well. Social psychology, um, which is sort of looking at the way in which people's, uh, uh, people interact with groups, uh, both and also at the individual level as well, and there's an aspect of personality there. Cognitive psychology, that's sort of the function of how you think, you know, memory, judgment, decision making. Social cognition, which is a bit of a crossover of social psychology and cognitive psychology. So how do you think about the social world? Uh, perception, uh, emotion, uh, personality, clinical psychology, health psychology, organisational psychology. And it goes on and on and on. Um, and we could probably add another 20 different areas. Essentially, academic psychologists study um, whatever it is that takes their interest about humans. Okay? So it's a pretty cool area to be able to work right? because you get to choose what it is. So these are the areas outside of university um, that you might be interested um, in working. Now, it's actually uh, rather fortunate at the moment with the changes to Medicare where psychologists, clinical psychologists, or anyone who's a registered psychologist can now uh, actually... Um, their clients can actually claim back from Medicare their services. Uh, this has meant that there's a lot more demand for psychologist services. 
right? Because it doesn't cost as much anymore to go and see a psychologist. So it's actually a good time to be studying psychology because um, there are a lot more opportunities. Now, outside of uh, universities, you can work in a whole range of areas. A lot of people choose to work in private practice, so that's where you might engage in um, clinical psychology or uh, family psychology or forensic psychology. Uh, a lot of seeing clients individually, uh, writing up assessment reports, those types of things. You can work for various corporations. Uh, you could work for consulting firms, market research companies, recruitment firms, test development corporations, advertising, sports clubs. Uh, we've talked a bit about education. I've, I've mentioned universities, but uh, psychologists also work in the area of education uh, in schools and career services as well. Right? So if you, do, um, if, you, if you become a qualified educational developmental psychologist, you can actually work with um, Education Queensland. You can work in other government departments as well, for example, like Department of Health or Disability Services. They actually employ a reasonable number of psychologists. Uh, corrections, which we talked about before, mentioned Education Queensland, Department of Families, and actually the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I've had fourth year students of mine go down uh, and work in Canberra at the ABS. Um, and the reason why uh, psychology graduates are particularly sought out for jobs like at the ABS and other government departments is because you get a training. Uh, in a range of social science uh, research methods. All right? So um, because psychology is backed by that research, um, uh, you know, is, is underpinned by the research skills that you develop through your university degree, uh, you as a graduate are rather appealing to these types of government agencies who conduct a lot of research. Because okay? it's a set of skills a lot of people don't have. Um, psychologists also work in health and welfare services like hospitals, rehabilitation agencies, uh, substance abuse services, youth services and secure mental health. And there are other community agencies as well. We've talked about the various um, forensic areas that psychologists can work, but the police force actually employs psychologists as well to help them in their recruitment and management of their um, personnel. All right. Uh, there are various counselling services. You would have had a Kids Helpline and Lifeline. They employ um, four-year graduates as well uh, to assist them in their jobs. Uh, the Defence Forces actually employ psychologists. Uh, the Defence Forces uh, want to make sure they select people who are psychologically uh, fit to serve in the Defence Forces, but then also deal with some of the challenges uh, and the stresses that Defence Force personnel uh, experience. Uh, Non-profit organisations also employ psychologists, again because of their uh, research skills. So I've had former students go and work at the Queensland Cancer Council, which actually does quite a bit of uh, research into changing people's behaviour. Um, and people also go off and get jobs at research institutions like CSIRO. Uh, there's actually a CSIRO uh, site located uh, right on this campus or next to this campus. Um, and the Defence Science and Technology Organisation also uh, employs psychologists uh, in a range of areas. And of course, uh, as we've mentioned before, training and development services employ psychologists. So you can see it's actually a really diverse range of places where you could work. Talking about, well, how do you actually go about studying psychology here at UQ? All right? and so how can you, if you want to become a psychologist, how do you get there? If you're interested in psychology, which is also good, but you don't want to become a psychologist, there are things you can do too. All right? So it's not always just about becoming a psychologist. You might just want to do a few courses to find out about psychology as part of your degree. So there are actually four ways to study psychology uh, here at UQ. Uh, you can enrol, if, you, if the first three ways I'm going to talk about here um, are the pathways to become a fully registered psychologist. Right? It's a little bit more complicated than what I'm about to say just at the moment, but I can, uh, I'll just start you off on what you need to do. So if, you, if you're planning on becoming a registered psychologist, you need to enrol in either the Bachelor of Arts or the Bachelor of Science or the Bachelor of Psychological Science. All right? Now, the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science are three-year programs. Um, you need to do an additional one year of honours, and it's a competitive entry into honours. Um, or you can do the four years of Bachelor uh, of Psychological Science. The OP entry, which you're probably, probably wondering about, for Arts and Science is, I think, around 12. All right? The OP entry for the Bachelor of Psychological Science was five this year. All right? Now, the difference is it's a higher OP entry here, but you're guaranteed to get into the fourth year of study. All right? With the uh, Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science, you do three years, and then you have to apply for the fourth year. So to give you some idea, this is going to change by the time you guys get to fourth year. Uh, this year, the entry uh, 
for the BSOC science people to get an individual supervised project in fourth year, which is um, the, the, the way of doing fourth year that gives you the most, op most options, the GPA cutoff point for that was 5.0. Right? So that's credits, an average of credits. Everybody below that still did fourth year, but they did a group project. Right? You still get a, an accredited four-year degree, but you just don't get honours in psychology. The GPA cutoff for our arts and science students, unfortunately, was close to six to get into fourth year. Right? Now, by the time you guys come through, the GPA cutoff for everyone should be about 5.5. Right, so it's not going to make as big a deal after this year whether you're in arts or science or the Bachelor of Psychological Science in terms of entry to fourth year, except if you get under the cutoff and you're not in the Bachelor of Psychological Science, you don't get to do any fourth year. That's the only difference. All right? You just exit with a three-year degree. Because our Bachelor of Psychological Science students get to do fourth year regardless of their overall GPA. It's just the GPA determines whether they get an individual project or a group project. Now, if you don't want to become a psychologist, you can actually still study psychology as a single major or a minor uh, or even just a few courses. Okay? You just pick the courses you want to do and as long as you've got the prerequisites, you just do them as part of your other degree. And your other degree might have certain degree rules that you need to uh, make sure you comply with. So some of the double degrees don't have much space for electives. Um, but as long as you meet the rules of whatever degree you're enrolled in, you can study as much or as little psychology as you want. Right? If you want to become a psychologist, you have to follow the advertised uh, approved sequence of psychology uh, courses. And this is actually set by the Australian Psychological Society, not by us. Right? So we have to make sure everyone studies um, a specific arrangement of courses if they want to go on and get registered. Now, if you want to do further study, if you want to become a specialist in clinical or organisational psychology or uh, clinical neuropsychology, there's further study you might have to engage in, for example, a coursework masters uh, or a PhD. So let me explain what this all looks like, uh, probably in a slightly easier to understand format. So here you've got the Bachelor of Psychological Science, which is four years long. You've got the Bachelor of Arts, which is three years. You've got the Bachelor of Science, which is three years. Now, if you do either arts or science and your GPA is competitive, you get into uh, honours, psychology, and do one year of that, um, you are now put in the same position as the Bachelor of Psychological Science people. Right? Uh, what this means is you can then seek provisional registration with the State Registration Board of Psychologists. Right? You can't practice as a psychologist unless you're registered with the State Registration Board. Right? It's a controlled field. You can't actually just go out and call yourself a psychologist. Now, provisional registration, so you're not a full psychologist yet, and this seems a bit cruel. You've already studied four years. Why can't you be a full psychologist? Uh, but uh, most of your undergraduate training, so these four years up to this point, is about the theory underlying psychology as a discipline. Most of your practical applied training uh, comes later on. And that can happen in uh, one of a few ways. Okay, You can either get two years of supervised practice outside of university. So you might go and get a job, for example, in corrections. There'll be a senior psychologist there. They're, if they're an accredited supervisor and they're willing to do it, they could supervise you for two years and then you can become fully registered as a psychologist. All right. If you can't find somebody in your workplace, unfortunately you have to pay for them. And I think the typical rate um, accredited trainers charge is something like $180 an hour or something like that. It can get expensive. Um, there are other options. Um, you can do a two-year master's coursework degree in clinical psychology, all right, which actually has those practical placements built in. All right? So that's where you actually go through with a set of colleagues at university uh, and we offer you, you know, all that practical experience and training that you need. At the end of that master's, uh, it could be in clinical psychology or org psychology if you're interested in HR, or it could be in sports psychology um, if you're interested in that. You can get fully registered as a psychologist. Okay, so six years of study, or six years of study and supervision, and that's what gets you to be fully registered as a psychologist. Now, if you want to um, study some areas, for example, like clinical neuropsychology, you might have to do a coursework PhD. All right, so this adds about three and a half, four years on top of your four years of undergraduate study. 
So not to scare you, but for some of the specialist areas, um, it's, it's you know, potentially up to eight years of study. Okay? Um, which is probably, seems like a lot, but as a psychologist, you've got a lot to learn about uh, the way in which the human mind works. It's a very complicated thing, um, and that's why it takes quite a long time to actually cover the diverse range of topics. And as a psychologist, what we try and do in your training is make sure you're well grounded in all the areas of psychology. So if you decide to go on and become a clinician, it's very important that you understand not only psychological disorders and the treatment of them, but also the way in which children develop, because you might be working with children, so you've got to understand developmental psychology. You also have to understand the social pressures on people's behaviour and their thinking, so you have to understand social psychology. You might need to know how memory works, right? how perception works, to understand why people are, you know, might be having these hallucinations uh, or whatever it is they're experiencing. So you actually have to understand a lot of aspects of psychology, not just um, the name of the discipline, the subdiscipline you're working in. Right? And so it does take a while to train in psychology, but it's actually an incredibly interesting while to train in psychology. There's another thing you can do if you don't want to become a fully registered psychologist is you can also go straight from honours uh, into a research PhD as well. Right? So if you want to become an academic, this is actually the pathway you would follow. Right, so after your four years of study, you would start a research PhD. And it's kind of like a research internship in some ways, where you work with a supervisor on a research project. Okay? Um, and you already you'd start working as a tutor there as well. So you get a lot of exposure to the sorts of things that academic psychologists do. Okay. Any questions about that rather complicated pathway to becoming a psychologist? Or remember, if you don't want to be a psychologist, you can just study some psychology as part of your degree. You don't have to do the approved sequence necessarily. Yep. Um, you don't. Okay. So the question is, if you become a registered psychologist, do you have to do your doctorate? No, not at this point. Um, they're still working on the guide, uh, the recommendations that, or the rule that, if you if you want to become a psychologist, you have to do a master's. They're still working at that level. Uh, so all that's required is that you have four years of university training in an approved psychology course plus at least two years supervised practice or a master's degree, in, in a coursework master's degree in, in, in clinical, sport um, or organisational or educational developmental or forensic psychology. All right? There are actually no different type. You can't register as a type of psychologist. All your training is designed to be a generalist training, even at the master's level. So if you do the master's of clinical psychology, you still have to cover some of the other areas of psychology as well. There's no such thing as, as a clinical psychologist. There's a registered psychologist. Yep. Sorry, what was the question? If you... Now you did the same subjects. The, one of the differences is um, the Bachelor of Science has uh, some common first-year subjects you meant to do that arts doesn't. Uh, so science <coughs> has different um, degree rules and requirements, um, and it does impact on the sorts of subjects you can study. But from a psychological, from studying psychology perspective, in either of those two degree programs, you can study, you can complete the um, approved sequence of study successfully. Uh, they both have enough room in their degrees to complete the extended major. It's, it's a longer sequence than a single major, but not as long as a double major. If you've, uh, if you've done the honours in psychology at the end of arts or science, I, I'm not sure they would mind either way because it's actually essentially the same subjects all the way through. There's two, there's two subjects at the undergraduate level that arts and science students aren't allowed to enrol in that Bachelor of Psychological Science students must do. One of them is Topics in Applied Psychology, which is a third-year course, and the other one is um, Psychological Thinking About Complex Problems, which is a second-year course. Uh, so arts and science students can't do those, Bachelor of Psychological Science students have to do those. I don't think an employer is going to care either way. Uh, they're just different pathways to get to the same point of being provisionally registrable as a psychologist. Any other questions at all about studying psychology right now? All sounds pretty straightforward, hopefully. Um, 
And I should point out, we don't throw you in the deep end when you enrol in psychology, whichever way you do it. The first year of psychology is only three psychology courses. All right? um, one of them is a stats course, and there's two introduction to psychology courses. Right, so we, we make sure uh, that you have a, a gentle landing, and we bring you up to sort of speed on the discipline um, and prepare you for second year. Right, so you, that's when you start to do more and more courses, second and third year, and fourth year is all psychology. Okay, so just to reiterate, if you want to become a professional psychologist, call yourself a psychologist and charge the um, approved rates uh, for psychologists. You must be registered with the State Registration Board. They have a website where you can find out more about it. And psychologyboard.queensland.gov.au. Um, you have to have an accredited four-year sequence of study. What I've been talking about this afternoon is, is an accredited four-year sequence, whether you do it through the Bachelor of Psychological Science or whether you do the three years in Arts or Science and Honours. And as I said, you have to have two years supervised practice uh, or a master's degree and the, and the various professional development activities, which are just ongoing activities to make sure your psychological training stays current. So like attending conferences and workshops and things like that. Okay, so now it might be a good time to talk about what to expect, all right? Okay, so what happens when you enrol in psychology? What's it like, uh, what's a first year psychology course like? What type of work can you reasonably expect to have to do if you come to UQ to study psychology, at least in your first year? Okay. Well, I don't know uh, how your, your various schools work, but um, here at UQ, with our courses, uh, pretty much all of them, I think all of them do, at least in psychology, have websites that accompany them. All right? So the idea here is you can go onto those websites and see announcements about what's happening in the course. Um, we send out reminders for deadlines. Uh, they have lecture slides. We put up the lecture slides. Uh, a lot of lecturers put them up before. Some put them up afterwards to help you take notes. Uh, some of our lecturers record their lectures, right? so it's not, not to be a substitute for coming to lectures, uh, but the idea is that if there's something you missed in the lecture, you can just jump onto the website, listen to the recording, and uh, actually make sure you, got, you understood the material correctly. Uh, students tell me it's great for revision, and they like to listen to them again. Um, I always think it put me to sleep. I've had to hear my own voice for two hours again and over and over. But they actually say it's really good because they can sit in the lectures, uh, sit back and listen, um, rather than trying to keep up and take notes, all right? because that can be a bit distracting. Uh, and so they like to review the, the recordings later on. Okay. The other thing uh, we put up on our websites uh, typically are discussion forums. Right? So these are pretty much like you see on the internet. They're just forums where you can talk to other students about questions you might have in the courses, uh, you know, you know, questions about the assignment, questions about the lectures. Uh, the lecturers and tutors will get on and try and answer those questions as well. So it's a good way to interact with each other. Now, what about the lectures? Right, so every course you enrol in will typically have one two-hour lecture per week. Right, so in first year, in the two main introduction courses to psychology, we do those lectures two or three times a week. You just come along to one of those offerings um, and, um, you know, listen to the lecture, write notes down, um, and basically um, find out about psychology. Right? We often set textbook readings to accompany the, reading, uh, the lectures as well. Now, you also go to tutorials as well. Now, the tutorials in first year are between one and two hours long. Right? And there's about a group of about 25 students that will be in your tutorial. Uh, and they will often either do activities that augment what we're doing in the lectures, uh, or we'll actually help you get ready for the assignments. Okay? So the tutorials are designed to be supportive. Uh, it's not meant to be like another lecture. It's an opportunity to talk to somebody who can help you with the work in the course. So all up, it's about three hours of contact per week per course that you're enrolled in. And the general rule of thumb is you should spend about another seven hours per week of um, activities related to each course. So each course you enrol in is about 10 hours of work a week. Okay? So you've got to treat coming to university a little bit like a full-time job. Right, because you're going to have about 40 hours of work on average per week to do. Okay? And that's if you are able to do that and study and read every week, work on your assignments every week, uh, you'll do pretty well. And so that's why we say about 10 hours per course every week, so you have a realistic idea of how much work's involved. Give you an idea of uh, an assignment 
uh, that my first year students do in, in Psych 1030, which is one of the introduction to psychology courses. It's a 1,000 word laboratory report. So in one of the tutorials early in the semester, we'll actually do an experiment with the students. All right, and so we collect some data. The students are the participants, so they'll actually experience the psychological phenomena. Uh, and then we um, do some analyses with that data. We talk students through how to write that data up. All right, so they don't have to do the stats. Uh, but they have to actually think about the experiment, what the findings mean in the context of the literature, and, and come to some conclusion about what the study found. Now, we give people lots of help with this type of assignment. Right? In the tutorials, we spend pretty much most of the tutorials talking about the assignment, the sorts of things you'd want to include, how you can interpret the, the results, um, and you actually you get to submit a draft of the first half of it, and all our tutors will actually uh, read your draft and give you extensive comments and tell you how to improve it. Right? So we're actually trying to be supportive um, and show you how to actually do this type of assessment rather than just expect you to know how to do it out of the, you know, straight out of the bat. There are also exams. You can't get away from exams. Um, we have two types of exams. In first year, we have uh, mid-semester quizzes or early semester quizzes. These are actually online. So you just go to the website, uh, answer a number of questions. Everybody gets a different exam, all right? so you can't copy from each other. Uh, but we don't care if you do the exam in your pyjamas late at night or first thing in the morning or from work or wherever you are. You can do the exam whenever you like. You get three days to do the quiz. All right? You can use your textbook. We don't mind. Uh, the end of semester exam is a little bit different. It's two hours long. Uh, there's about 72 multiple choice questions, and you come to university to do it. It's invigilated, which means uh, we have people walking around making sure you are who you are and that everyone does their own work, and, um, and you can't come in your pyjamas. All right? So you can only do that for the mid-semester quiz, sorry. Uh, we do get some of the college students turning up in cowboy outfits and things like that sometimes, but um, anyway, I'm not sure why that is. Um, but those exams, generally, uh, people have loads of time to do them. Um, they find them pretty straightforward, um, and we're not trying to trick anyone up. We give you lots of practice exams to actually get a feel for the sorts of questions we're going to ask. So that's sort of a bit of an overview of what will happen uh, in, in a first-year psychology course if you come and study psychology at UQ. Obviously, uh, the sorts of learning activities we do in higher years uh, are a little bit different, so the, the reports become a little bit more uh, complicated or complex, a little bit longer. Uh, you'll be expected to do more of them on your own uh, to show your own learning. The exams become a little bit more extensive, so we'll start to ask you to write essays and, and um, short answer questions and to think about the psychological phenomena that you're learning about. All right? uh, up to the point where you get to fourth year, and if you're doing an individual project, you'll work with a supervisor on a research project all year and uh, the end product of that is something about 50 pages long uh, that's actually describing the, the logic behind and reporting the research project that you designed. Right? By then, you would have had enough training and help along the way that that's actually very achievable. Right? So that's what we're trying to get you to by starting you off in first year. Okay? I won't tell you what a PhD thesis looks like because it's quite a lot longer. Right? But the whole point is that at each semester and each year, we're trying to give you more skills that you can apply in the next semester. Right? So you're, never, you're not thrown in the deep end. Uh, we give you lots of help. There's lots of people you can come and talk to because um, you know, we actually just want to see you guys do your best and learn as much as you can about psychology. We're not trying to sort of trick you up.